So we're now going to consider the statement of the Bolzano Novaeus theorem. And we're going to discuss it a little bit to make sure that we know what we're talking about uh, before we prove it. The statement is quite simplistic. So it's almost not assuming anything. So we have an infinite sequence of numbers Cn. They belong to a closed and bounded interval AB. And that's it, that's the hypothesis. And this means that Cn has a convergent subsequence. So we ought to know what converges means. So the crucial part here is to understand what a subsequence is. So this is what we're going to discuss. So the definition is as follows. So if Cn is a sequence, then dk, so we now use a different symbol than n here for the indices for convenience, then dk is a subsequence of the Cn if what? Well, one, all dk appear in the sequence Cn, so they're all terms from this thing here, and two, the dk respect the order of Cn. So this formulation here is a bit vague. So let's let's maybe call it definition like this. So let's let's explain what I mean here by an example. So if you have a sequence here, Cn, I don't know, one over two to the n, and goes from zero to infinity, how can we choose a subsequence? Well, first of all, let's write out a couple of terms here and so forth. Now, if I do dk equals to, let's say one and then an eighth and then one over 32 and I don't know, then this is a subsequence because every term here belongs to the sequence here and they respect order. So they appear in the same order as this guy here. Well, if I did, for instance, well, one eighth, one, one over four, one over 256 and so forth, this would not be a subsequence because I'm not respecting the order. So the terms here come in a different order than up here. So notice that while in a subsequence, I don't have to pick all of the terms here, I do have to pick them in order. So if I pick this guy, then I have to pick as my next guy, someone after him. And since I picked this guy, I no longer can pick any of these two guys, but my next pick can be anything after this. So for instance, this one, why not? And then again, the next guy I have to pick will have to come after and so forth. So this is not a subsequence. And now what we can observe is the following. So there's a clever way of giving names to elements in subsequences. So this guy here, he is, well, he is C naught, right? And this guy here, he was well, C naught, C1, C2, C3. So this was C3. And this guy here was C5. And this guy here would be, I think, C8. So notice we can write this DK here as a sequence of C's where I'm choosing indexes for the C's. So a clever way to express this is to say that, well, this is C n naught, where n naught is zero. Then my next guy is C3, he's C n one, where n one is three. My next guy is C n two, where n two is five. And then this guy here would be Cn3, where n3 is eight, and so on. So when I choose a valid subsequence, what I'm doing is I'm choosing Cn's from my original sequence, but where my indices form a strictly increasing sequence, right? So notice here, here I'm getting a sequence nk that's strictly increasing. This gives me an elegant way to formulate this definition. So as a definition, proper definition of a subsequence, I can say the following. We say that dk, k goes from zero to infinity, is a subsequence of cn if the dk are equal to cnk for all k, where nk is a strictly increasing uh, sequence of integers. Well, of natural numbers, I should say here. Because then we have exactly the situation that every dk is a member of my original sequence. And since these nk's are strictly increasing, the dk's respect the order of, of the original sequence. So what is the bolzano weierstrass theorem saying? Well, he's saying that for any sequence in a bounded and closed interval, there exists a sequence nk 
for strictly increasing natural numbers such that the sequence C and K converges. That's the point. And let's do an, a small example of this. So as an example, let's take a sequence that very much does not converge. So Cn equals to minus one to the n. So if we let n start at zero, this would be one minus one, one minus one, and so forth. So this sequence here uh, does not converge. But if I do now nk is equal to 2k, meaning that my d0 is c0, my d1 is c2, my d2 is c4, and so forth. And this is just 1, 1, 1, etc. And this certainly means that my c and k, which is c2k, which is just 1, that this is a convergent subsequence. Now notice that there are an infinite number here of different convergent subsequences. So this is just one particular choice, but if I can choose the first million terms randomly, and then I choose every term after this according to this rule, right? Then he will jump around for a bit and then it will stabilize. Or I could have chosen nk here to be all the odd numbers. Then I would have gotten just minus ones here and I would get a subsequence converging to minus one. And we can look at more examples. Why do we care about closed bounded interval here? Well, okay, so in the statement we have here, then actually closed is not so important. So what we get from closed is that this has a convergent sequence with limit in uh, AB, okay? So the closed guarantees us that the limit stays with inside of here. Uh, the bounded is the thing implying that we are convergent. Let's just see what happens if we have an infinite interval. Then for instance, Cn equal to n squared. Why not? This is a sequence that has no convergent subsequence, right? Because any subsequence of this will have to respect the order. So any subsequence of this will increase at least as fast as this thing here, right? Because, well, this sequence here is 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, and so forth. And any subsequence of this will be, well, taking this guy and this guy and then moving to the side here. So necessarily going to infinity. And it's the fact that this guy is not contained in a bounded interval, which is crucial here. Being closed here is uh, a less dramatic thing, which, well, it's important sometimes to guarantee that the limit is inside of here, but it's not as dramatic.